Savedhani, Savedhani, which is, of course, ladies and gentlemen, Hindi for Achtung, Achtung. That's our 20th language, by the way, although, as someone kindly pointed out, we haven't used English yet. What is English for Achtung? Write in. We have ways. Hashtag. There's plenty of time for all that anyway. And if you do have a language you'd like to hear at the start of the show, please get in touch using the hashtag We Have Ways. I'm struggling to work out the correct translation in Swahili, for example. Achtung's one thing. Achtung, Achtung is something completely different. No idea why. Anyway, last week's show was recorded live at Edinburgh at the Fringe and we had to cut some of it out on the grounds that dressing people up on stage doesn't work brilliantly in an audio-only format. But we had a lot of fun, didn't we, James Holland, or Jakobus Niederlander, as I like to call him. These yeah, days. I quite like that. I, I want to be called that more often. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did. We enjoyed it a lot. And um, I think there's a pretty good chance we'll be uh, doing a few more live events in the coming months. Um, and of course, yeah. if we do, we'll let you know as the battle plan develops. But um, Al, quite a fair amount has been going on in the last few weeks, hasn't it? I mean, you've been busy. Well, yes, I've been. At, uh, I mean, I was at the Fringe doing a full show run, so I've um, scuttled back to London broken it bro- <laughs> well, you actually did do three things on the day that we did the live show because yeah we did yeah. the podcast then you did pub landlord and then you did yeah. your band very late yeah. we started at half past midnight yeah well yeah yeah so i, I basically Grueling. broke my broke myself last week and um i've re- I scuttled back to london not unlike um uh, the bf in 1940 <laughs> <laughs> they can't defeat you if you're not there you never forget that um uh, so uh I uh, yeah I've been and I've been uh, well you on the other hand have you've been um, where have you been well I've been I've actually been in Deutschland I've been uh, over in Germany uh, I've been doing yep. some filming and um, actually, I've had a lot of fun I'm not going to lie I'm uh, I went to this guy's place and um, he has <laughs> he has one thousand seven hundred World War Two weapons in his own personal armory I mean. You, you, honestly, I kid you different, not. Different, different weapons, or lots uh, of the same. So he's right. he's got maybe a, uh, about eighty five Lugers, wow. um, Walter PPKs. God, good yeah. to say so many. He's got little mini pistols which he sort of set up in a frame, all in a row. It's sort of. He said, "Yeah, you know, I, I use this as my wallpaper," and <laughs> I've got to say it did look really cool, but but quite weird, <laughs> quite an odd thing to have. Anyway, we went to his firing range and we were able to fire. You know all the submachine guns, the machine guns, the whole the whole shebang. I mean, it was absolutely amazing. Then I had a go in in one of Hitler's staff cars, um, a, a six wheel um, Mercedes six wheel. G4. Yeah, yeah, it was, six wheel. So not it was in, freaking not, huge. Well, but and you know, I mean, if the if the German cliche being over engineered um, is true, then six wheels is a bit of a giveaway. Isn't it, it was unbelievable i mean the detail on it was absolutely incredible um pistol holsters in every door <laughs> really <laughs> yes <laughs> it was just and um i had this picture of hitler in this car which the owners at the museum were a bit coy about they said well we're not quite sure whether hitler actually used it but there's a big picture of him you know entering czechoslovakia in the very machine and um wow and anyway standing up in the front seat and i was thinking so i tried to get up and, and stand up in the front seat and i said well i don't know i don't see how he could have done that because you know seats in the way and they went oh yeah hold on a minute and they lifted up the seat so you, you could sort of prop up the seat so you could actually stand up and sort of, you know, do Z-class you're a lot, stuff. You're a lot taller than Hitler, though, James. Yeah, but even so, I mean, you know, once the seat was up, you could stand up there. You could, uh, you could, okay. you know, you could do that pose. Felt a bit weird, if I'm honest. Um, but, but A bit weird. A bit weird. Very a bit weird. weird. Very weird. Very weird. Entirely weird. It was. The whole thing was weird. It was just so enormous, this car, honestly, and, and just so luxurious. And, and the attention to detail was just so incredible. Um and and you know you were just sort of thinking this is Hitler's car so yes it what was, was it very, very what weird. was it a, a, a Mercedes Beamer? G4 right. a Mercedes okay. G4 um, and then I've been looking at U boats and um, and doing all sorts of things so it's been it's been good but one of the places I did go to um, which was really interesting was the um, surrender place uh, of uh, where which where, one? where the Germans surrendered to the 21st Army Group to Montgomery what L- Lunenburg Heath yeah yeah oh wow yeah yeah oh, that's Timmel cool. Oberg it's a hill, yeah. and, and Monty deliberately chose the hill. It's not, not a massive hill. I mean, it's sort of a rising land, I would say, with sort of trees yeah. on the top and everything. You go down this track, and there's this memorial stone and stuff. I think it's not – it's it's sort of something like about 300 yards from where the actual actual surrender was, which is now in a military there was, zone. Because there was a memorial, wasn't there, and it used to get vandalised and stuff. That's and right. They removed it for fear of upsetting the locals. You think? Yeah, well, now they've got a big, no. stone, big granite stone, and underneath it says, you know, um, war should never happen ever again. 
um, yeah. of course. Um, but it was... Um, they started it. But anyway, the, 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 thing, the thing is, the, I mean, the, the, the drama in that tent is so fantastic. That yeah, whole it? story. Yeah. And, uh, and um, uh, that he'd obviously been... He'd been rehearsing the moment. Montgomery had obviously been rehearsing the moment in his head, had been practising what he was going to say, how he was going to behave. And then the, the, the Germans arrive and there's a major with them, if I remember rightly, and he says, what are you, are you? What are you doing in my headquarters? Get out. And yeah. chucks one of them out. And does this whole dressing down thing and that they're not, that they don't speak for the um, OKW or OKH. It's just like, he it, it, it doesn't... He tells them to go away, doesn't he? Yeah. Go away and come back when you've figured out what you actually want. Yeah. Which is just the drama of that. Yeah. When, when obviously, obviously the war's ending and or ended, and uh, it's so. I mean, I that moment. I, I, I know people think he's a prig, but at that moment, what a brilliant thing to have a prig right there in the middle of <laughs> yeah. the middle of things. Yeah, and, and right he had it all he, recorded, didn't he? But you know, he, yeah. he arranged it so it's filmed, yeah. it's recorded for posterity. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's interesting, the whole surrender thing, because it's it's a bit of a sort of fiasco, really, because the German surrender, I think, is on the 2nd of May in Italy. That's the first unconditional yeah. surrender. Then comes the one on Ludwig Heath on the 4th, which is then signed on the 5th. Then yeah. Yodel and co. turn up to Schaeff headquarters, you know, Supreme Allied headquarters in Reims on the, on the 7th and sign on the 7th. But the formal surrender comes in on the 8th. Then the Russians get a bit annoyed that, you know, they've been surrendering to the Western Allies and not them. Yeah. So they then have their one at Carlswell's on the 9th. So there is all these different different surrenders. But it's amazing. I just find it absolutely incredible that they go on a kind of more than a 24 hours beyond Hitler's death. I mean, you know, why don't they all just surrender on the 1st of May? I mean, it just seems amazing. Dern, it's yes, takes but, over. But- but, but 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 again, the, but the thing is, the end of the end of the Second World War is unlike, probably unlike any other war. Most yeah, I wars, guess. you have a, a decisive battle, and one side goes, "You know what? We've lost." Yeah. All right. Uh, what 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 are the terms? And and a negotiator. Th- th- this wasn't an option, um, either in the either in the in, in Europe in the West or in the East. You know, unconditional surrender is only really uh, is only on the table because there aren't any terms that you can give a the Hitler government, are there? No. And and there, there aren't any terms you can give a Dernitz government either. No. And and Himmler's scrabbling around with Count Bernadotte, yep. trying to sort of trying to wangle some kind of uh, settlement so that he can gain power. Basically, he yep. thinks I'll be I'll be the new Führer and I'll get the remnants of the Reich. But you look at the there's a map, a fantastic map of the remnants of the of Dernitz's Reich, which is a little spit of land in the south. Yeah. A little spit in the north. Yep. And basically Flensburg. F- exactly. And and yet he still like kind of has a hoods part to you know to carry on as though there's something to negotiate, there's something to settle. I mean, it's it is remarkable how after say I don't know after after the Ardennes has failed, the Ardennes offensive has failed. It's ob- it's over. It's obvious. There's no. There's well, I think the moment where it really really is totally. I mean, of course it's over. I mean, it's been over since, as far as I'm concerned, since November 1941. But it's really yeah. really over in February <laughs> 1945 because that's yeah. when the Reichsbahn collapses, and the yeah. Reichsbahn, interestingly, is the glue that keeps the Nazi war effort together. That's that is the key to the whole thing. The moment you know. Everything, so, everything so, moves by so rail. So in a way, in a way, so it's literally he made it, the moment they couldn't make the trains run on time uh, to, to yeah. <laughs> spin a spin yeah. a, an existing phrase. It all the wheel. I mean, the wheels literally came off. They literally I mean, come off. Yeah, they, they, they just really can't function because they can't do anything. They can't move yeah. anything. They can't move yeah. any. You know. uh, and then and then you get the thing with the gal lighter and the cries lighter all yeah. like they all. Some of them dissolve their local parties. Some of the gal lighters, some of the cries lighters go. You know what? Games up. Dissolve the local parties. Others say, no, we fight on. We fight on to the last round. Yep. They have civilian organisations like women in towns getting yep. together and saying enough's enough. And then they either they either they win a local struggle and they're able to surrender the town to the Allies, or the opposite happens. Yes, and you have and, and you the, have and you have seventeen year olds dub- kind of being strung up, kind of yeah. twenty minutes before the Americans and they arrive. double and they double down, and literally twenty minutes before the yep. yeah the Americans arrive. And then in the east, you've got a completely different texture where you've got. Towns like Demin, you know, which are, which features that book we've talked about before, yeah. um, "Promising to Shoot Myself," where you get a suicide yes, epidemic, yeah, yeah. and where you get um, towns 
towns, either people evacuating, and the the usual picture is the Gau lighter or the Kreis lighter or the or the Nazi party leader suddenly vanishes. Yeah. He says to everyone, "We fight on, we fight to the last round," and then Schoener, they disappear. Yeah, he's, that's he's, right. he's yeah. the worst. I mean, the most awful Wehrmacht general of them all. Yeah, he's just the worst. He's the most unpleasant, horrible, evil Wehrmacht field marshal of them all. And he's an army group commander right at the very end. And he just goes around sort of willingly slaughtering his own men for very, very spurious reasons um, and saying they're not fighting hard enough when clearly the whole thing's collapsing. Then the moment it looks like his neck's on the line, he flies out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Horrible. Well, and the, and the Gauleiter in, um, in Breslau as well, that's yes. as well, to, builds, knocks down a housing estate to build an airfield. Um, so he flies, out. flies out. He's the only person who gets to use the airfield. He flies out. He then de- ends up in the hands of Czech partisans. And they don't know who he is, so that, but they murder him anyway. Yeah. Um, or kill him. Uh, that's a question of taste, that one. And, and the, 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 I mean, it's just the end is so, is so interesting. And you've got soldiers saying, it's my job, my duty as a Wehrmacht soldier to defend the Reich, whatever. Even though I know the war's lost, even though I know that this regime's corrupt and disgusting, I must fight my duty. And you sort of think... How the, the how on earth if, if, did they end up there? And and you look at the history of European wars, which always end with a decisive battle, and then someone yep. goes, "All right, I'll throw in the towel. I'm done." And the Second World War is kind of unique in that respect, um, uh, uh, historically, because even the First World War ends with a with a negotiated peace and yeah. and and terms yeah. and all that sort of thing. No, that's very true. It's just, but the other thing that's really interesting, I think, is that you know. Two of the people who are absolutely desperate to keep the war going are yeah. Wehrmacht commanders, who you'd think, you know, on one level, would be really su- surprising. I mean, the war would have been over in Italy a lot earlier had Karl Wolf yeah. had his way. He was kind of him yeah. as deputy and kind of right hand man, and he was the senior police, um, senior SS general in Italy, and he'd been working with um, the OSS and the, and the Americans for and with Dulles um, for mm. ages to try and get a peace. And it was Kesselring who is a yeah. Luftwaffe field marshal, who was going, no, you know, we... we, we yeah, but he's, a, but he's a Hitlerite. He's, a com- he's completely... Yeah, yeah, but, but, but there's completely... an there, isn't there? And it's the same with yeah. Dernitz. You know, I mean, I've, obviously, I've read, read Dernitz's um, uh, memoirs, and you sort of think, well, he seems a reasonable sort of fellow, and, he, and, and, <laughs> and, and, and his son, you know, was, was lost in the U-boat war. And, and, you know, on one level, you sort of think, well, he's just a sort of honest serviceman doing his bit for Germany. And... You know, he seems quite sort of plausible when you read his thing, but he was an absolute monster. I mean, yeah, an absolute monster. He's, if, your, pro- he's your proper Nazi. He really was. He was absolutely awful. I mean, you know, and he and this guy called Admiral Heyer. Do you, I, I mean, you know, they had these kind of sort of midget submarines at the end of the war. They were yeah. so desperate. They thought, well, what are we going to do? We've got all this shipping coming across the channel. The best way to do that is actually not with huge, great Type 7 um, and Type 9 U-boats. Let's get these little midget ones. And they were just inhumane. Uh, and they were yeah. keeping people in them way longer than they should have ever been kept. Well, they should have been in there in the first place. But, I mean, you know, yeah. max 24 hours. And they're keeping them in there kind of, sort of four days, five days. So how do you keep them awake when they can't really move from the position they're in in this midget submarine? Speed. Speed. A bit more than speed. It's more oh. than speed. So they do all these tests. The Navy go to the SS and go, look, we, we want to kind of sort of try and find this drug that's going to be good for um, our, our midget submarine um, pilots. Um, could you test them on, Sa- on the, your prisoners at Sachsenhausen? And they go, yeah, oh. yeah, no problem at all. And they've got this, they've, they've got this boot, um, this boot track. So they were making synthetic boots, and they'd give them to the right. prisoners to test them on different. And so you have, when you go to Sachsenhausen, they've got gravel, they've got stony bits, they've got kind yeah. of rocky bits, and they just tramp around them in a circle all day long until they've got blisters or drop dead or whatever, um, and see how these boots fare. So they used these prisoners and they gave these prisoners different cocktails of, of drugs. And one of the ones they came up with was something called D9, which was a mixture of uh, methamphetamines, you know, yeah. sp- um, crystal meth, sp- yeah. and pure cocaine, and something else. I can't remember what it was. But I mean, it was just you know, absolutely... Where do, where do I, then, how do I join the German Navy? <laughs> and then they gave them to these, these pilots, of which... Collectively, yeah. of all the different types of midget submarines, over seventy percent were killed. Yeah, you, but they also, but they also had a wave of um, of uh, uh, attempting to use fighter planes to ram German bombers, as, uh, American yes, and British right. bombers as well. That's right. And so you have people signing up to kamikaze, mm. uh, as yeah, it it's were, not just the Japanese, and, and get and and, and with, it doesn't work. They lose loads of pilots. They lose loads of planes. I mean, what what what? I mean, again, what's so odd is the last three months 
um, that, that, that anyone's still fighting, that they can e do anything coherent at all. Because obviously Germany's yeah. journey is, is set with the, as you say, with the, the end of the railway, the thing's fallen in on itself. And it's its political structures that keep, that keep it going, which is, I think, really, which is really, really interesting. Yeah, given and, how, corru and some of given how self-evidently corrupt they are. Yeah, and some of these Wehrmacht commanders. Anyway. I mean, that, that was the point about Dernitz, really, was, was that he was sanctioning and pushing these, these drug tests at Saxon House. Yeah. The other, the other place I went to last week, which was absolutely incredible, was the Valentin Type 21 U-boat assembly plant. Right, right. And they started building this in 1943 with gargantuan numbers of, of um, uh, um, slave workers. Yeah. So about ten or twelve thousand. It's yeah. absolutely enormous. Four hundred meters long, hundred meters wide. Is it is it a Nazi mega structure, James? Possibly. <laughs> it has been, but I was there on a different <laughs> purpose, uh, not on Nazi mega structure on that particular occasion. But anyway, this so the, so the RAF spotted it was being made immediately and just clogged, locked, you know, clogged it and um, uh, clocked it rather and, and kept sending them over on federal consoles, watching how it was progressing. And then on the twenty seventh of March, when it was almost complete 1945 617 squ squadron came over with a combination of um, tall boys and grand slabs you know the 10 ton yeah. earthquake bomb and got through the weakest part of the ceiling which was only five meters thick and that was it put it out of action wow and some six thousand slave workers were killed in the process of making this and they never ever assembled a single submarine in this place and it, it is it is so big i mean i, I just i cannot you know, just words do not describe how gargantuan this is. Well, well. So, how long is it? A mile long? What, it's it's four hundred meters. Let's try long. using. Let's try some using some words. Four hundred and twenty meters long, a hundred meters right. wide. But when you're in it, it is absolutely goppingly big. And who was building that? The the, the Kriegsmarine. Yeah, right. It was Speer and Dernitz. It was their idea. So that's four football pitches, I'm told, yep. um, by someone sat next to me. That's uh, that standard size Premier League football but pitches. Utterly Amazing. pointless. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, yeah. Nothing. But but the thing is, is what could they have done instead by this point of the war anyway? Because, Surrender. Because, well, 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 obviously, well, obviously and the, you know, which is what where it keeps coming back to, isn't it? Is that is that really it is so? I mean, I think it's it is remarkable that you have a. You, you, that that Germany is in the grip of a, a, a this sort of political spell, you know, yeah. and it's the oath, it's the oath, and like you say, it's remarkable they carry on after Hitler dies. Yeah, that that the, the oath somehow for some people seems to sort of spill over. I suppose there was great confusion about how he died, and you know, because they did say they they did in the communique say died defend gallantly defending Berlin or blah blah blah, didn't they? Yeah, and I suppose the people that believed that believed that, and the people that didn't didn't. Yeah, uh, I guess. Yeah. But anyway, if anyone ever is in Bremen or near Bremen, I mean, this thing yeah. is called the Valentin Assembly Plant. And it just, right. it, honestly, it has to be seen to be believed. It's, it's just astonishing. And actually, they've got the remains of one of the Grand Slams that was dropped on it on the floor still. And all the, and all the sort of the rubble is still crumbling down, hanging down from the ceiling from where the bomb penetrated. What's a, well, here's a, here's, so here's a, a question that, it's just occurred to me that follows on from what else could they, have, why build it? What else could, should they have done? Was it worth 617's time and effort to destroy it? Because if it was never going to be completed, if it was never going to be, if it was, if they were never were going to assemble any subs in there, would 617 have been better? Um, you know, because by this, by this time, they're basically picking, picking things to knock down, aren't they? Yeah. The, the, uh, well, maybe I know. I've got to say, I never thought about that. I just think it was sort of, you know, it was, it was a sign of, you know what, you think you can build this thing which is impenetrable, but we've got your number. We've been watching you build this the whole way. And yeah, the yeah, yeah. Is close. You know, it's supposed to be a kind of psychological thing, I suppose, as much as anything. As much as anything, which is that kind of um, idea of uh, shock and awe, isn't it? Effects-based operations. You do something that makes yep. the other side go, oh, we're done for. But you're talking about the Germans at the end of the Second World War. You can do that all you like. It's until you actually have <laughs> captured their city. Yeah. Uh, their capital city it's never going to happen no. it's fascinating fascinating yeah you, you you get to go to the best places james i had oh. to go to glasgow and play in a, gr <laughs> in a band in a gr grotty bar and that, although it was we had a great <laughs> night on wednesday fantastic right now like all great armies this podcast marches on its stomach james will return after tea and biscuits <laughs> Welcome back to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. The podcast has established a beachhead. We put boots on the ground in Bovington, Chalk Valley, Wiltshire and London. James has joined live from the Eagle's Nest in Bavaria. He did. He did, you know. And we've journeyed north to meet our Edinburgh Brigade. 
Next up, we're heading to Holland, where we plan to bring you a daily podcast during the nine days of Operation Market Garden. Yes, a bridge too far. 17th of September to the 25th. More of that in future shows. Lots of brilliant stuff on Twitter in the, in the past couple of weeks, and we'll get to it next week. But our email box is groaning with great questions and observations. So we'll try and get through a few of those in this part of the show. So, emails, James. Emails like the old people send each other. Here we go. Yeah. This is from Brendan Green. He doesn't give his age, but I reckon he's older than 60. Um, hi there. Loving the show. Enjoy. <laughs> Probably find he's no, 27. Come on. Old people use email. The kids use it. Snapchat and Insta, don't they? <laughs> um, enjoyed your me- mention of the reissued Colditz board game however that's pretty old fashioned these days as a combined board game World War 2 nerd I can, can I recommend a game called Black Orchestra just the name's got me a yep. cooperative game where you take the role of a real historical ca- character e.g. Canaris Stauffenberg etc and conspire together to assassinate Hitler wow it charts the program that sounds world. absolutely sound. fantastic this sounds right up um, your strasser. Um, th- th- this charts the progress of the war through decks of cards is, uh, and they're full up of history of the historical detail. And it can get very tense when the Gestapo um, turn up and get interested in a suspicious character. I mean, this, this raises a good question. Um, I, I mean, it sounds like a lot of fun. The, the plots against Hitler. Yeah. They were, they were either things like the White Rose people who were students who mm-hmm. published some leaflets and then were, and then were murdered for it. Yep. There were communists who were politically active, um, you know, from the old days of before the Nazi government. There were people in the in in the military, and and there were people high up. I mean, Canaris, Canaris is interesting because you know he ran the Abwehr. He, yeah. he was a he was he, he was an important person in the in the in the military framework in the Third Reich. Yeah. Yet yet mobilized against Hitler, and it's quite interesting that you have these sort of. These people, uh, and, and he was, he, that was before the war. He, he, 38, he was involved in some sort of anti-Hitler scheming, wasn't it? Yeah, the, yeah, there were quite a few of them. And, and Halder, of course, who was chief of staff yep. of, the, um, of, of the army in the first part of the war. I mean, famously, you know, he, he, he went to a meeting with Hitler, I think, in November 1939. And he had the pistol in his pocket. And he got, you know, he yeah. was just absolutely, realised he was sweating buckets and kind of, you know, was absolutely not made out to be an assassin and just didn't do the deed. But he had the opportunity. And someone then said, you know, talked about the spirit of Zossen. And Zossen, of course, was the headquarters where the OKH, the army, had their headquarters. Uh, and, and he interpreted that as they know uh, and so completely retreated from any further sort of assassination attempts. But there were lots of them. And then, of course, famously, it was von Tresco who, um, yeah. who had the bottle of Quantro on the plane, uh, yeah. which went with Hitler. And it didn't detonate, but it, it so easily could have done. And that would have been good night, Charlie, for everyone on that plane. When, when was that? That was 43, wasn't 43, it? 43, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just imagine, I mean, people talk about Stauffenberg as a, as a, as a counterfactual, you know, if he'd successfully, would the Allies have, would the, you know, because the, the thing on his, on Stauffenberg's shopping list, of course, was that the Allies would unite with the, the Western Allies would unite with the Germans and fight the Russians. Yeah, right. But the, the, I, mean, the, I mean, one of the interesting things about Stauffenberg is, is actually what he wanted and actually what he represented. Um, it, it's not a particularly palatable list of no of things he was after no. but at least he was at least he was starting in the right place <laughs> um uh, uh, by wanting to bump off hitler um uh, 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 and i i mean but 43 if tresco if his quantro had exploded what would that have done would would you oh god it's but, just fascinating isn't it i mean it's fascinating to think about it i mean it was i mean in a way that had that should have been more successful than a kind of briefcase under a, under a very heavy oak table yeah yeah yeah, yeah, really bad luck that. But that's if you're trying to use a fruit-based drink, take out the fuel. You're, um, you're, you're, you're done for. Right, okay. So, so, so but Canaris is, is, yeah. I mean, you know, he, he there's. Yes, he he sort of is anti-regime. You know, he's very much kind of Germany yeah. first, not the Nazi Party. Um, yeah. But throughout the war, the SS are trying to kind of undermine him and undermine the Abwehr and all that. And frankly, yeah. with you know, pretty good reason. Um, yeah. Uh, because he is working against the regime. Um, but his his demise is an interesting one because he gets, the, the Abwehr gets gets disbanded entirely in like January, February 1944 or something. He's then put yeah. on kind of gardening leave. Then he's under house arrest. And then I think in, I think it's June 1944, he's taken out of house arrest and given some position in Berlin. 
Then after the Stauffenberg plot, the failed assassination attempt, he is then arrested, put in Flossenburg, but he isn't executed until the 9th of April yeah. 1945. And I, I, if I remember rightly, I think with, you know, the old hanged with piano wire treatment. And and he because because he's there's all this score settling at the end of the war and there's also the guy who tried to blow Hitler up in the uh the, the in thirty eight isn't there the, in the beer hall there was a guy who that's tried to, right yeah and he isn't executed until around the same time as Canaris yeah. when the when the the whole thing starts you know Ragnarok when it will go to Demering when it all starts falling in on itself yeah. and people are like well you we never trusted you so and I think it's remarkable really that that guy. I can't remember his name. That he survived until 1945. Try and blow Hitler up in 38. You'd think, well, that's the gallows for you, Charlie. At the very least. Bad luck. At the, at the, bad the guillotine. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the guillotine. Yeah. And, and, and it's that, that, there's this very odd thing that, that they, they keep people on often well past what you'd think was, was their their shelf life mm. in, in, a, in a Nazi state. It's, I mean, it's, the end is fascinating. And we, you know, we talked about that in the first part. The end is so interesting because so much is going on all at once. And Germany's having this incredible, weird political conniption as everything goes completely wrong and people carrying on as though nothing's going wrong and other people going, well, we'll all go down together. Uh, yeah. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll be the last guy with the last bullet. Yeah, blah, yeah, blah, yeah, blah. yeah, I mean, yeah. It's quite extraordinary. Our next question, Andrew Johns says, loving the podcast, genuinely, not just saying that to get my question read out, but it worked. <laughs> you know, that's yeah, real well done, politique, Andrew. isn't it? Yeah, well done. Long may it continue. Imagine it's spring, early summer of 1944. The Germans are preparing for the invasion of Europe and the Soviet summer offensive. The uh, Japanese are about to launch their invasion of India at Kohima and are defending the Pacific against the Americans. Suddenly, the Axis powers wake up in each other's country. Wow, this is a counterfactual and a half. This, is a, this isn't what if, the, what if the bottle of Cointreau had gone off in 43. This is... What if suddenly we're in a complete parallel universe? The Germans are in Japan and their forces have taken over the positions and responsibility of their Japanese allies. Well, the Japanese are in Germany with their forces facing the Western allies and the Soviets. How would they fare? Would the Germans be more successful in, in, in India and in defending the Pacific given their military and supply capabilities? Would the Japanese have been able to defend against us in the West and the Soviets in the East? Or would we have won the war by Christmas? Keep up the good work. Regards, Andrew Johns. Well, well my first answer to that is what military and supply capabilities? I mean, you know, certainly by 1944, the Germans don't have much supply capabilities at all. I mean, they're, yeah, they're on their ass. I mean, as, di yeah. as discussed, very dependent on the Reichsbahn. Well, there aren't many railways in, in Burma and northeast India. There's a few, and they're all weird different gauges. And the Japanese don't have access to many of them, just a few of them in Burma. Um, and they still don't have any air power. And, and that's, the, that's the key to their Allied victory in, in, in Fall is... The fact that you've got these six airfields around Infal itself. So what Slim does is quite deliberately is get the um, is is as the Japanese attack, he does a fighting retreat to kind of to to attrit the Japanese as they're following, as they're advancing, and to make the Japanese think that the Brits are doing what they always do, which is just retreating because they're rubbish. But actually, they're grinding the Japanese down and overextending the Japanese lines of communication. As they near in file, so they can start flying in lots of goods and extra supplies and stuff, counterattack and absolutely annihilate them. Uh, and basically, that's what that's what happens. So, so, so basically, the British are fighting in three dimensions in in yeah. in, in Burma mm. because they've got air, they've got sea, and of course, sea is all part of the, yep. the the bigger supply logistic picture. And they're strong on land, whereas the Japanese are fighting in one dimension on land because they're yeah they're they're rapidly running basically. out of shipping. That's certainly certainly true. Um, the Germans don't have any really have any merchant shipping in the first place. Um, by 1944, they haven't got much air power. And they certainly haven't got any transport planes, and they certainly haven't got enough to do fighter cover over Burma. So I, I think the they Germans, would do terribly. Would the would the Germans have fallen for um you know uh, uh, Slim's flypaper that you, you he makes you stick. He makes you stick to him, and then uh, and then kills you. If you saw, so I think they would have done, yeah, because they would see that as an, a success, and they've always got to reinforce success. And and you know, they, yeah. there's nothing they like more than kind of being on the front foot. You know, attack is the best form of defence, and all that kind of stuff. So I reckon, yeah, though, I suspect they would have fallen that hook, line, and sinker. And their problems in their problems in Burma would have been essentially the same as their problems in Russia of, of distance, yep. supply. Yep. Um, that it's that it's and the terrain, the terrain. While neutral isn't exactly friendly, you yeah. know, play, plays badly for both sides, but but is a difficult terrain to, yeah. to deal with. Yeah, particularly okay. if you haven't got air power. And of course, unlike the Japanese, who by 1944 have got some experience of jungle warfare, the Germans wouldn't have yeah. had any if they're suddenly transported to it in 1944. And the Japanese in Normandy? Well, a few more tunnels, I guess. Um, a few more bunkers and trenches. But... Yeah, I mean, they'd have made the most of the bocage, wouldn't they? They'd have, yeah, um... they really would have done. 
they would yeah. have done. They'd have squirreled into winkling, that. winkling them out to the last man would have been the, essentially the same problem, mm. which is the which is what they you know what 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 the Allies find in dealing with both sides is that is the blasting a position, laying waste to it, pinning your enemy down, stopping and moving. These are all things that are doable. Yep. It's the getting the blokes out of the foxholes or the it, prepared positions that is where you have to go man to man. You have to go, or you send in a crocodile and flamethrower them out. Yeah, which they would have done. I mean, I mean, sure it's interesting, isn't it? Because because the Japanese don't have many tanks, and obviously, and they don't have really big anti tank guns um, like the Germans do. So that's that would make life tougher for them. But actually, the Germans in Normandy have also got an awful lot of not very good troops and troops which are very happy to do their hand to hock thing. Um, yeah. Whereas the Japanese are universally across the board very unwilling to do hand to hock so yeah, and completely so, motivated so so extent, they would yeah. they would have probably fought even tougher than the germans but they wouldn't have had the kit that the germans have i mean they don't have 88 millimeter or anything approximately they certainly don't have a tiger tank or panther so in a, in essence that question is nonsense but nevertheless <laughs> fascinating because we've managed to talk about it for five or six minutes <laughs> um now thomas moke uh, says hi gentlemen just wanted to say uh, first off to say how enjoyable this podcast is oh, how thanks. fun the eclectic subjects you cover are well you know I, I you know we wouldn't do it if, it if if we didn't think it was fun i never know if i'm going to learn about a tiger tank submarine spitfire a panther panzer or a hawker hurricane world war ii alliteration there right to the fore i do have one topic i'd like to discuss underappreciated aircraft of the second world war some aircraft are often mentioned as they're iconic Let's say the Spitfire, pick a name out of a hat, but some do not get the credit they deserve. My granddad was a fitter and armourer on Bristol bow fighters in the northern uh, North African desert. Yeah, I love these those extremely planes. Extremely, yeah. Well, so there were. So he goes on to say, six thousand of these produced more than around the same as the Mosquito, double the amount of typhoons, but they don't get the love. There isn't a flyable bow fighter. There's one being restored though. Um, Duxford, I think, and uh, and there's a very good one in Hendon. The, the RF very in nice, Hendon. really, really love it. One in Great Nick at Hendon. I think there's one at um, Cosford as well, but I might be wrong. It might be a Bofa. Anyway, that but it was an all round plane. That was the interesting thing about it. Is it? Is it? It did everything. It was a kind of workhorse. It did a lot of um, uh, shipping yep. stuff. Um, it wasn't a sort of stealth bomber like the Mosquito. So it's not. It's not. It's not a wooden wonder it's not got that kind of sex appeal. No, and it can't fly kind of over four and fifty miles an hour at thirty five thousand feet or anything like that. But it's fast, it's pretty manoeuvrable, it's pretty robust, uh, and it's absolutely bristling with cannons and machine guns, bombs and rockets and all the rest of it. And, and you know, it's a fearsome weapon. Very, yeah. very... Uh, I think they're fantastic. And when you do have a look at that one at Hendon, you just sort of go, whoa, look at that. That is a really, that is a really good-looking, you know, big old plane. It really, really is. It just looks good. And, and that... Listen to him, ladies and gentlemen, listen to him. And, he's... he's <laughs> I get a bit carried away, aren't I? Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. You're a bit into this, James. <laughs> but there's this old adage, Al, isn't there, about planes? Yeah, that if they plane look good, board. they are usually are good, and if they look a yeah. bit crap, then they usually are crap. Um, and, well, that, and, and the yeah, high, and the well, bow fighter is yeah. one of those. I think it's a sort of evolution yeah, but, of the of the um, uh, of the Blenheim and then the Beaufort, yeah. which is a sort of between the two. And these guys were doing incredible stuff in the Mediterranean. I mean, a lot of the... Um, obviously, you had the, the temp submarine flotilla kind of knocking out Axis shipping across the Mediterranean. But you also had these bow fighters coming in and dropping torpedoes and bombs and, uh, and strafing, you know, um, Axis um, uh, uh, freighters as they're going across the Med and stuff. Uh, and actually, it was a fantastic re... Uh, re um, uh, rebirth of Battle of Britain. Do you remember that? It was a sort of comic book. Um, I, it, it passed me by, but I have an idea of what it might have been like. Yes, yeah. uh, it, it doesn't take a massive leap of the imagination. I mean, we've but, just but the new about one, plain porn, and now you're yeah. on about well, some the new plane, one is it? reimagined as Battle of Britain as this pilot, and he's in North Africa and he's flying bow fighters, and it's absolutely right. fantastic. Right, brilliant. You see, I like the Westland Whirlwind. That was always the plane I thought that. That looked great, but yep. was was a, a dog by It account. did look pro- really good, though, didn't it? So that's really, that, that just yeah. goes against what I was just suggesting. It had problems with its engines, and uh, and they never they never ironed them out. They never fixed it. But then the Typhoon had terrible mechanical problems, so they stuck with it, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, and it developed into the Tempest, which is I think that's pretty forgotten, isn't it? And that was an absolutely amazing aircraft, elliptical yeah, yeah, wings, yeah. really beefy, could fly well over four hundred, you know, plus miles an hour. Again, could carry rockets, machine guns, cannons, a whole lot. And yeah. um, 
There's an amazing memoir, which I didn't mention the other day when we were doing favourite books and memoirs of World War Two, but called The Big Show by Pierre mm. Klosterman. Uh, have you ever read it? No. OK, well, you're in for a massive treat because it's completely brilliant. Okay. And he's a Frenchman who, who joins the RAF, flies Spitfires to start off with. Um, uh, and in the last few months of the war, from the autumn of 1944 right up to the end in 1945, he's flying these Tempests. And it's still a pretty bloody tough battle. You know, lots of ground yeah. flak, um, ME 262s they're coming up against. And it is just some of the best aviation writing that's ever been written. It's completely fantastic. Yeah. So um, yeah. have a look at that. Anyway, he's flying these Tempests. And, um, and, and actually, it's just been republished, I think. No, right, okay. Well, I'll I look don't that think up. I called? know. What's it called? It's called The Big Show by Pierre Clostin. The Big Klossin. Show, Pierre Clostin. And one okay. other plane I'd mention, the Heinkel 112, which is completely forgotten about and never really fought in the in the war, apart from 40-odd that were handed over to the Romanian Air Force. Developed by Heinkel around the same time as the Messerschmitt um, 109 in the early part of the 1930s. Again, elliptical wings. Uh, inward turning undercarriage so very stable on the ground good rate of climb really fast bubble canopy so really good visibility cannons and machine guns but had this incredible range of about 750 miles an hour which is unheard of for a, a single engine fighter in the 1930s am i right in thinking someone who worked on the spitfire had worked at heinkel and no he, he, it was beverly shenstone the, beverly shenstone was the yeah. guy who designed the wing of the spitfire it wasn't mitchell yeah and he had worked yeah, that's for right, yeah. junkers Young, he was right, Canadian. Okay, okay. He was a Canadian. So the cross, the cross pollination is. But he met Heinkel, and right. he knew all about Heinkel's um, pioneering work on elliptical wings that Heinkel was doing in the 1920s, and which he then applied to the Heinkel 112, which was, I think, first flown in 1934 or something. Right. So right, when right. when Shenstone then joined Supermarine in 1932, um, uh, and they're getting that commission to do that absolute dog, the type. 224, yeah, which is the kind yeah. of first Spitfire, um, that yeah. gets scrapped. It looks like a Stuka. Yeah, yeah. that looks like a Stuka. They then, uh, then when it comes to re um, uh, starting from scratch all over again and doing the Spitfire, he says, well, look, let's try this elliptical wing. And Mitchell yeah. famously says, I don't give a shit about the shape of the wing as long as it flies properly. And it can take machine guns. And why were there so few of these 1112s made? Uh, I'm not really sure exactly, but I think it's just to do with good old fashioned um, um, Nazi kind of bonkers decision making, um, yeah. which is that uh, Professor Willy Messerschmitt um, sucked up massively to Goering and Hitler. They really liked him. He was a party member, all the rest of it. There was a whiff right. of Jewish blood in Heinkel. Um, right. and, and Goering personally really liked the Zestora, you know, the ME110, yeah, the yeah, twin yeah, engine yeah. one. So, so you want pairs of fighters. And so they end up going into the war with the 109, which is great, apart from its visibility, which is, which is awful. Uh, and the 110, which is a terrible... Um, daytime fighter instead yeah. of having this combination of the 109 and the Heinkel 112 which would have been an awesome um, combination and, and some people have kind of sort of questioned my um, my championing of the of the Heinkel 112 all I would say to that is that I remember talking to Eric Winkle Brown about this and of course he was a, yeah. the legendary test pilot flew the more greatest planes, test pilot of all time possibly the greatest pilot of all time I mean flew kind oh, of okay. 285 planes or something it'll never ever be equaled um, and he said he thought the Heinkel 112 was absolutely fantastic. He said it was a really fantastic plane, really easy to fly, very forgiving, um, had amazing visibility, and he miles preferred it to the um, the ME 109. But Messerschmitt was a better better at schmoozing Nazis. Definitely. So it's not what you know. It's, it's that old adage. It, 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 it's who you heil. Okay, <laughs> right. Well, um, I'm afraid it's time to leave the front line for yet another week. If you're new to the show, please do subscribe, rate and review wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks, as always, for your correspondence. Yes, and um, please do keep it coming to hashtag WeHaveWays on Twitter or by emailing us. We had that earlier if on. If you're but... old, if you're old, email <laughs> if you're old. <laughs> yeah. but, or 27 and, and be retro. <laughs> then um, it's, the email is WeHaveWaysPodcast at gmail.com. Cheerio for now. Auf Wiedersehen, mein Liebling!